sisters and brothers in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. How did you come to faith? Not just to know about Jesus, but to know and trust and have a relationship with Jesus. American Christians have a thing for the kind of conversion experience that is sometimes described as one and done. A one-time conversion experience that we hope changes our lives forever. The story of Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus is often pointed to as an example of this kind of one-time conversion. I've heard people, and you've probably heard people, tell their conversion story in a way that sounded like bragging about how bad they had been, and then seemed to take credit themselves for their own conversion, instead of giving the credit to Jesus or the Holy Spirit. Of course, the credit for coming to faith is really due to what Jesus has done for us and to the Holy Spirit without whom we wouldn't even know that Jesus saves us. And most conversions aren't really one and done. Even Paul, for example, may have gone in the course of a few days from looking to kill Christ followers to being a believer. But he was already a devout Jew and an Old Testament scholar who just needed to be convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. Martin Luther famously said that people need to be converted three times, once in the heart, once in the head, and once in your wallet. Jesus' 12 disciples give us a different model for thinking about conversion as a process, perhaps a lengthy process. As we know from the good news according to John, Jesus' ministry lasted approximately three years, And over the course of those three years, the disciples gradually learn who Jesus is and what he means for their lives and for our lives. And they gradually come to faith. On Easter Sunday, Pastor Bob asked us who we are looking for. The answer, in case you missed it, is that we are all looking for Jesus, even if we don't know that that's who we're looking for. And we're hoping that he will change our lives. If we follow the disciples as they follow Jesus, we can see how they, over time, learn to answer the question of who Jesus is and how he changes lives. So let's begin, actually, at the beginning. A very good place to start. Right, Begin at the beginning of the good news according to Mark and see over the next six weeks how the disciples learn who Jesus is and how that helps them experience conversion, not as a one-time thing, but as a process that continues as they spend time with Jesus. In Mark chapter 1, we read that after John the Baptist was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news. The time has come, he said, The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. There are three things there. It's time. Not chronological time. Not one day after another on a calendar or check your watch time. But the time is right. It's God's time. And the kingdom of God is at hand. The Greek for at hand could be translated in many ways. The kingdom of God is within you, in your midst, in your reach. I think the best understanding in the context of Jesus' ministry is to say the kingdom of God is here. It's available now because Jesus brings the kingdom. Now, because the kingdom of God is here, it's time to repent. It's time to turn around. It's time to change your mind. It's time to decide to live differently This is an opportunity to let the good news of Jesus and the presence of God's kingdom change your life, to give you something that's better than your old normal. Jesus combines here two concepts that appear regularly in the Old Testament, but not together. First, 
the kingdom of God. And second, because of the kingdom of God, repent, change, because God is calling you to change. You see, Jesus affirms, or maybe more accurately reaffirms, the Old Testament, which was, after all, his Bible and the Bible of first century Judaism. But Jesus also reinterprets or redefines the Old Testament, including the expectations and the understandings that were held by most first century Jews. We understand the Old Testament differently because of Jesus and because we believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Only a couple of verses after calling people to repent and believe, Jesus calls his first disciples and begins what we might call an itinerant preaching or teaching ministry. He's recognized as a teacher. We're told twice in Mark 1, verses 22 and verses 28, that the people saw Jesus as a teacher who had authority. Oddly enough, we don't get much of the content of Jesus' teachings until Mark chapter 4, where Jesus tells four parables or stories about the kingdom of God. The first of those parables is the familiar but lengthy story often referred to as the parable of the sower. You probably know this one, which we tend to think of as a story about our personal faith or lack thereof, how we respond to the message of Jesus' death and resurrection. But Jesus' original audience would have heard it much differently. They thought of themselves as God's garden, God's vineyard, or maybe God's field. They thought that the seed of God's word would bring God's kingdom and that the kingdom of Israel would be restored. When they hear Jesus proclaiming that the kingdom of God is coming, they hear that as saying that God is going to rescue them. The last almost 600 years had been tough for people who thought of themselves as God's chosen people. 600 years earlier, Jerusalem got conquered by the Babylonians who took Israel's leadership and their families off to Babylon as slaves. Later, the Babylonians got conquered by the Persians, who let them go back to Jerusalem. But it wasn't the same. For most of of that time, up until Jesus, Israel was ruled by someone else, including even the Seleucids, who had desecrated the temple by slaughtering a pig on the altar. When a revolt against the Seleucids succeeded, it turned out that Israel's own rulers were corrupt. And now the Romans were in charge. So Jesus' listeners are hoping for their God, Yahweh, to exercise his sovereignty and vindicate the nation of Israel by winning a victory over the Romans. They wanted victory. They wanted the pagans defeated, the temple properly rebuilt, not just what Herod had done. They wanted, they wanted the Messiah to come and lead the people to victory. They wanted Israel properly observing the Torah, even if they didn't all agree on what that meant. And they wanted the pagans flocking to Jerusalem to worship the true God, Israel's God. For first century Jews, the kingdom meant military or political victory coupled with religious restoration. And in that environment, Jesus says, hold on. That's not what the kingdom is going to look like. God's word, which does not return empty, will bring the kingdom. But you might be surprised. You think you're all in. You think the victory is for you. But the parable of the sower says that there are four possible responses to God's word. God's word which brings the kingdom. And only one of them is right. So for starters, many of you, maybe most of you, aren't really going to be part of the kingdom. There will be a great return for those who hear it, accept it, and persevere 
but most of you have the wrong idea and you're not really going to hear it. The kingdom of God is not going to be what they were expecting. And it's not really what many Americans expect either. The kingdom of God isn't just life after death. The kingdom of God isn't just the end of the space-time universe as we know it. Consider this line from the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And what comes next? On earth as it is in heaven. So God's kingdom, we might call it God's rule and reign, is God's will being done on earth. And when you pray that prayer, you are praying that God's will be done on some global scale on earth, but also in your life and in the lives of your community now living in a relationship with God that changes your life now. So we can see how Jesus was reinterpreting the first century Jewish understanding of God's kingdom. It wouldn't look like what the people of Israel were expecting. Which brings us, finally, you might say, to the two parables we read just a few minutes ago. In the first of those parables, Jesus says that the kingdom is like a man scattering seed on the ground, like in the parable of the sower. And then, whatever happens, the seed grows. It begins to grow underground, unseen, maybe even secretly, and eventually it sprouts. This might remind you of Jesus' resurrection, He couldn't rise unless he died, just like a seed doesn't sprout unless it goes into the ground. But with the seed, it's a gradual and perhaps lengthy process, which we may say is how God raises believers to new life in the kingdom. The seed is sown, the word is heard. And new life grows gradually, perhaps even unseen. This parable also reminds us that a judgment will come. When the grain is ripe and the farmer harvests it, the harvest will not be all grain. There will be weeds. If you looked in my yard, you might say it's mostly weeds. There will be weeds which will be thrown into the fire. Just because you were in the field doesn't make you part of a good crop. Not everything in a garage is a car. In fact, nothing in my garage is a car. What's in my garage is boxes, not cars. Again, not everyone who thinks they are part of God's people is in the kingdom. The parables of the mustard seed sorry, the parable of the mustard seed, there's only one parable of the mustard seed, also reinterprets or defines the kingdom of God. The kingdom won't appear all at once, dramatically in splendor. Instead, it will begin inconspicuously. Those who expect Jesus to lead an attack on the Roman governor's palace will be sorely disappointed. But what Jesus offers is a redefinition not an abandonment of Israel's hopes and dreams. Yahweh has planted a small seed which will grow into a great shrub or a tree. Jesus' ministry, which did not look like the kingdom of God people expected, was in fact the beginning. With 12 disciples, one of whom turns on him at the end, and some of whom desert him, Jesus began a revolution that changed the world. The image of birds coming to nest in a great tree that provides shade to those in need. This image of those birds tells us that the whole world, not just Israel, will be invited to join the kingdom. God promised to Abraham that the whole world would be blessed through him and his ancestors. That promise comes true because of Jesus. We see in the first four chapters of Mark, especially today's reading, 
that Jesus was a teacher. If Jesus is only a teacher, we can decide whether we think he's a great ethical teacher or whether we think he's a nut. And I know people who would say if he's only a teacher, he must have been a nut because he said some pretty weird stuff. But of course Jesus is more than that as the disciples learn while they continue to follow him. Today, we've seen how Jesus' teachings challenge the way we think about the kingdom of God and what his rule and reign can mean in our lives. Over the next five weeks, we'll learn more about who he is, what he can mean for us, and what he means for the world. I encourage you to join us for worship during this series and let Jesus change your life as we follow him along with the disciples. Think back to the question we started with. How did you come to faith? Not just come to know about, but to know and trust in Jesus Christ, and then to let Jesus change your life. The Apostle Paul often talks about being justified or made right with God. We American Christians often talk about that in terms of being saved. And we often talk like Jesus saves us, but then it's up to us to be good. Now, I can't really speak for you, but I can tell you that if it's up to me to be good, to always do the right thing, I can mess that up on a regular basis. But the orthodox theologians, and for that matter, Martin Luther, remind us that justification or being saved isn't one and done. It's a process. It's a lifelong process in which Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, changes us. The more we know about Jesus, the more we know him, the more time we spend with him, the more we can learn to live in his kingdom, recognize him as our leader, and let his will be done in our lives. Amen. I invite you to stand up for this as we, as we stand and, and respond to God's word about who Jesus is and what he's done for our lives. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. For our love moment today, and as we're moving all of our on-site worship services into our worship center, while continuing to worship online, I want to pause for a minute and thank everyone who helped in so many different ways make our worship on the lawn possible. At the risk of missing someone, Thanks to those of you who did set up, those of you who did tear down, those of you who did sign in, those of you who provided donuts. Some days you were my favorite people. And to the ambassadors who helped welcome people to worship. Thank you all so much. And thanks to those who have made and continue to make our online worship possible. And of course, We still need your help with worship. All of us have received gifts from God, and those gifts are given for the building up of the church. As we read in 1 Peter chapter 4, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks... They should do so as one who speaks the very word of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. 
To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. As we have moved worship and our Messiah Kids ministry indoors, we still need, and we actually need more, assistance in carrying out our ministry here at Messiah. If you can help in any way, particularly through assisting with worship or with our children's ministry, please let us know and we will gladly put you to work for the good of the kingdom of God. Thank you for your gifts of time, talent, and treasure. As always, if you wish to make a financial gift, you can give through our website, messiahyl.com, or our giving app, through your own online banking, or you can mail a check to our offices or bring a check to our Monday morning drive through food collection. Thanks again for all that you do to support Messiah and our ministry of loving God and loving one another. God of mercy and compassion, you win victory and overcome sin, death, and the power of the devil. Bring us to yourself and open for us the way to enter and live in your kingdom. Pour your love and power into our hearts so that we can live in your victory and by your values, so that your will may be done in our lives, so that we may honor you as our King and our God. Help us to live out and share the blessings that come from living in your rule and reign. By your Holy Spirit, anoint us to live lives of love, faith, and service to you and our neighbors and inspire us to share the good news of your cross and your resurrection, the coming of your rule and reign in this world and in our lives with all we meet. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.